Welcome to Proven Improbable. I'm your host, Maurice Jackson. Joining us today is James Pettit. He is the president, CEO, and director of Abin Resources. Mr. Pettit, welcome to the show, sir. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Mr. Pettit, for someone new to the story, who is Abin Resources, and what is the thesis you're attempting to prove? Well, Abin is a, it's a gold exploration company, so it's a junior exploration company. Uh, it's located in Western Canada. We have three projects underway. Uh, the primary focus of the company is the in the Golden Triangle, northwestern BC. Um, it's called the Force Kerr Project. That's the one that we just put out some pretty gangbuster uh, assays on our first hole of 2018. So it's a very good start. We've also got a uh, project in uh, northern Saskatchewan, which is also gold, and, and in the Yukon, right next to Golden Predator, which is um, also a very interesting gold project. You know, you discussed three of your projects here. Beginning with your flagship project, Forest Kerr is approximately 23,000 hectares. What type of lithology is prevalent there? Well, the size of the property uh, is being very long and narrow. It's 40 kilometers long. Um, probably 10 kilometers wide. Um, the reason it's shaped the way it is is because we acquired land that is right along a massive structural feature, which is right in the heart of the Golden Triangle. It's called the Kerr Fault. And um, that kind of acts in our minds as an engine for a, for a lot of what has been discovered there uh, over the last three, four dec three decades anyways. Um, and you need that engine, right? And uh, that's where potentially a lot of the fluids come in off these subsplays off of it. So, you know, it's prime location. Took a while to get it. Took about a, almost a year, eight months to a year to acquire. There's three different properties, and uh, we're earning 100% in the three that, in, that incorporate that whole land package. Now, Aben already has historical data on the Forest Kerr project. Is that correct? Lots. Yeah. Each one of those properties came with a treasure chest full of past historical data because there's been a couple cycles up there. You know, the initial discoveries of SNP and SK and then, you know, back in the in the 90s, um, you had another run up there and then and now. And it's just started about three, four years ago. Um, it's, it's made a big difference with all the new um, access. Uh, you know, the infrastructure is fantastic massive power generating plant on the Eskit River, which is at the south end of our property. Um, massive generating system. Uh, highway runs right up beside the whole region. Uh, highway 37 goes all the way up to Yukon and Alaska. It's all paved now. And then we have access in the northern part of our project property is uh, Glor Creek Road heading to the Glor Creek Mine, which looks like it could get new life because Newmont's now invested in it. And uh, on the south side is the, my, the, the, the access road into the Alta Gas Power Project. You know, so what you've just shared with us kind of ties into my next question. Who initially conducted the initial drilling at Forest Kerr? And after that initial data was collected, why did the drilling stop? Well, uh, like I said, it, it's been three waves of exploration up there. And uh, initially, the, the initial discovery would have been back in the days of this famous or infamous mining promoter Murray Pezum with uh, one of his companies. Um, Ron Nedlitsky, who was my chairman, uh, was in that, he ran that company. Uh, he discovered SNP and was involved in the discovery of Escape Creek back in those days. Uh, you know, and then the it just ended very quickly because the price of gold collapsed. And then again, you've got another resurrection in gold. Interest starts again up there and, and, and it sort of falls out of favor again for the same reason. Uh, you know, not necessarily about gold. It could be any reason, but the, you know, this risk, high-risk venture market just took a downturn. And, uh, you know, people just left their shovels in place and walked away. And now we come back because you've got, well, now that SK is shut down, SNP is shut down. SNP is now being resurrected by another company of Ron Nedeliski's. Um, there's more exploration work going on around SK Creek, You've now got Imperial Metals uh, Red Chris Mine right up in the north corner of the Golden Triangle. 
uh, you know, that's a big copper project that's now in production. And you've got Predium uh, with their Bruce Jack project down in the, you know, south of us. Um, that is a really high grade, big project. Um, so there's, you know, more discoveries are being made. Uh, there's some pretty good uh, discoveries last year being made. Um, probably the biggest year of exploration up there. Um, Garibaldi's come out with a nickel discovery. GT Gold has come out with, um, you know, up, up towards the Red Chris mine. They're working on uh, a project there that's been turning out some pretty good numbers, and I think pretty soon they'll have a good-looking resource. Um, you know, and then what we've just found is uh, kind of a, you know, it, it's it's an amazing it's probably the highest grades we've seen in Western Canada in decades in, in a one hole. And, but, it, you know, that zone we've hit had three of our holes from last year. That's what brought us back this year. And, and it's basically confirming it. And now we're trying to get a handle on the orientation of it and the structure, uh, which just means we've got to drill more holes around it to expand on it. You know, interesting to note, and I want to commend the geological and technical ac acumen of uh, Avon Resources team here. You've reviewed the historical data and recently commenced a drill yeah. program, and you just released some fascinating assays. What can you share with us? Yeah, well, what I'll tell you about the, the you know the the historical data um, when you had up to twenty thousand soil and rock samples taken across the whole property and. Um, just trying to remember the number of holes, 120 holes drilled historically before us going there. We've got a you know tremendous amount of data, and then you've got to fine-tune that down and prioritize a series of targets. And this boundary north zone is the best target, um, you know. And it, so we're gonna we're gonna test it and see how big it is and how big it can get. But first, you have to get a handle on the orientation, like I just said, and, you know, it's a very complex area. This this whole Golden Triangle, I envision it as an island chain of volcanoes crashing into the North American plate, and it's unique to the world. Um, there are some comparisons to the Philippines and that sort of geology, but this has got a lot of, um, you know, it's, it's, it's crushed, it's turned over, it's upside down, it's sideways, so you end up with a lot of VMS, uh, you end up with a lot of structurally controlled um, systems and uh, a lot of hydrothermal events, uh, which is great. That's the high grade stuff, and, uh, and there's a lot of porphyries in there. Can so you, it's a it's a real jumble. It's it's really an, an, an impressive area. Can you comment on the grades that we just received on the 9th of August on the press release? Oh well, yeah. Well, that hole. Um, it, it surprised us. We we actually drilled and drilled a, a 45 and a 50 degree angle. Those la holes last year were 45, 50, and 75. So as we approach what we were drilling last year, we're coming in underneath. And uh, to be honest, I thought we'd hit more of the same. Uh, last year there was some really great numbers. Um, 6.7 gram gold uh, with good percent copper and and good gram silver over 10 meters um, that's okay there's lots of that around there and then we had a we had a hole that was um, almost 11 grams over 12 meters that's really great um, that's getting better but these were in very broad intersections uh, you could extend those out to that first hole was actually extended out to 387 meters but that would be like a quarter gram mm -hmm. but it was consistent so that means there's consistency there uh, and, and the same with that second hole I just mentioned, you know, it stretched out over 122 meters. Um, that was, you know, uh, one, 1. 1.2 grams. So there's big, broad consistency. Now what we just did is came in slightly under, probably, there'd probably be a, a 40 meter separation, let's call it, between the holes. And uh, that hole had four intercepts in it four distinct intercepts and you don't often see that and uh, the headline one was was spectacular you know it was 10 meters of 38.7 grams uh, within that was uh, 62.4 grams over six meters and you know that's spectacular that's just one intercept in that hole you've got uh, additional intercepts of 22 grams uh, over four meters you've got another intercept of 3.9 grams over 13 meters and and another one of eight grams over six meters and one of those holes had really high copper attached to it but 
you know, that's neither here nor there. Uh, you know, last year's holes were pretty much uh, correlated to calcopyrite. Whenever you hit calco, you can determine whether it's massive calco, you'll have high-grade gold, similar to what GT gold, um, what mm -hmm. the, the environment they're in. This hole underneath what we just came out with, very little calco. It's carbonate. So we've now got a new mineralizing event in the in the same area. Um, so, you know, there's lots of surprises to be had. We've still got seven holes to report in this immediate zone. Uh, it's going to be interesting for us because it's, it's, a high, it's very complex, and we do need a handle on the orientation, and this will give it to us, you know, the more holes you can put in there. Plus, we're bringing in oriented, oriented core so that we can... Uh, get a real handle on it. And once we, once we do that, then we know what, what angle to hit because apparently the angle is making a big difference because you can see what we just came out with. Well, I want to be one of the first to congratulate you on a great start here to this uh, yeah. drill program here. And, and just to let everybody know, I'm, I'm the one that's not the geologist. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm, the, I'm the corporate guy. Uh, but I got enough geology background to, to uh, have a pretty good understanding of it all. But we do have good people. Ron is excellent. Um, you know, so pretty much retired, but he's still a very, very sharp guy. And then Tim Termundi is uh, very active as a director, and he started his career there with Ron. Well, we'll be able to cover the entire team here later in the interview. You know, one of the yeah. virtues I like is the use of optionality by Aben Resources. You've essentially taken over projects that were capital constrained due to infrastructure and glaciers now that have been since receding. Uh, although early, the drill program is validating the thesis, and that's very, very intriguing. You know, Mr. Pettit, we've covered your flagship project. Let's move to the east and discuss the Chico project. What can you sure. share with us regarding the Chico project? Well, it's it's got a fair fair amount of historic information attached to it. It's in an area that people don't associate uh, looking for gold, and that would be Saskatchewan. I mean, it's got the one gold mine, the Claude Resources, which is uh, just east of uh, La Ronge, south of the Athabasca Basin, where everyone looks for uranium. But it's an exposed greenstone belt, I guess is what you can call it, in the middle of the prairies. It's the, the sediment layer is, is, is in that area, I guess this is uplifted a bit. Um, and it's also associated to a major fault called the Tabanor Fault that runs from you know, the middle of uh, the Athabasca Basin up by Rabbit Lake all the way down to South Dakota, um, which, you know, the Homestake Mine, the huge Homestake Mine was associated to the Tabanor Fault. And off that fault are all these splays, and that's where the CB and the Santoy deposits came from, at Claude Resources. And uh, then I'm south of there along the Tabanor, just, just to the east, or sorry, the west of the Tabanor Fault. And we've got these shear zones, we call them splays, coming off there. And they, they offer up tremendous surface samples. And, uh, you know, historically there have been a few holes from old companies, uh, once again, one of Ron's old, old companies was in that area. And um, over the years there's been several holes drilled and they've all hit the encounter gold at shallow depths. And, and uh, you know, we're going to go back in. Uh, fortunately for us, um, Silver Standard, which is now SSR, has bought the Claude Resources mine for $337 million, and they've optioned all the ground between them and us, called the Fisher Properties, and they're drilling 18,000 meters of exploratory holes using a exploration thesis um, that, you know, yes, you've got to be on these splays, yes, there's a, some sort of an intrusion, there's a they're geophysical targets down below that come up to about 200 or 175 meters deep. And that's their, what they call their discovery horizon. And we're just south of them, and I've got this massive geophysical dome right underneath us. It comes up to 200 or 175 meters deep. And I'm going to, by the time I get in there to do the work we want to do, uh, they will have come out with some sort of information as to how successful they've been. So it's going to work out perfectly for us. Now, I will I will give a, ca a caveat. I was going to do it this winter, but, you know, we had all the approvals. We discussed everything with the First Nations. When we moved in and put the camp together, some of the trappers who are a little more, um, uh, 
I don't want to say radical, but they're just a little more upset. And there was a election going on, the band election, and uh, they they came to the camp and asked us to leave. And I just said, you know what? Fine. So we just packed up and left. And now they want us back because the election's over, and you know whoever won won, and uh, the government wants us back in there in a hurry. So we'll put that one together for the winter because it's a perfect place to drill in the winter. Saskatchewan's all frozen. You can move rigs around easy and transportation is all by sled or skidding in or helicopter. So it's it's good. It's not mountainous. Now, James, for those of us that are concerned about jurisdiction, what did the Fraser Institute remark about Saskatchewan? Well, the number one jurisdiction in the world or one of the top and it is. We, uh, you know, I'm involved in another. I'm a chairman of a uranium company, Sky Harbor Resources, and you know, it's it's a great place to work. But you know, we just happened to have some upset guys that were fighting with the council or whatever, and the elections coming up, and they saw us there, and they said they weren't informed, and you know, that happens. Um, the government it went right to the premier's desk, and uh, they basically done some things for us in terms of uh, assessments. We don't have to file assessments this year because it really surprised them. This this wouldn't normally happen. And uh, now we've been back up there three times with our people to uh, to to just see how things are and are you going to be okay with us going back in? You know, I really appreciate your veracity regarding the, what's going on currently there at the Chico Project. Finally, we have one more project to discuss and it's located in the Yukon, which is the Justin Project. Uh, what has uh, Aben Resources excited about the prospects there? Well, it's it's a bit of a sleeper. We uh, we actually uh, drilled there in 2011, 2012 when the Yukon was really really raging, and uh, we we came up with what we thought was an intrusion related gold system, uh, which can be very large and and a little bit lower grade, maybe two gram to three gram, um, but they can be big. That's what Fort Knox is in Alaska. Um, for example, but that Tintina belt is known for it. But as you get away from the the intrusion, you start getting fracturing in the I call it the country rock. So you get these big fractures and you get these big veins as you get away from it all. And that's where Golden Predator is. That's a Three Aces project, which is, you know, they've been there for years. They're spending a lot of money. Uh, it's very high grade. Um, they adjoin our property and uh, what we did because the, where we're connected where we're touching each other's property uh, we did a soil sampling program last year and we took a 30 kilogram sample and sent it in for gold grain analysis and uh, just to get a grain count we want to know if we're close to this uh, hydrothermal systems that they're looking at and it came back uh, pretty startling you got 30 kilograms worth and you get you get a you know over two thousand um, gold grain samples in that sample, and there are and eighty percent of them or more are pristine, meaning they haven't mobilized. They they're they're probably sitting on it, or thereabouts, very close. So that's what we're doing this year. We're taking a mechanical backhoe up there, we've got to fly it in, and uh, we're going to trench, and we're going to see. And the fellow that's running going to be overseeing what we're doing is we used to run. Uh, the Three Aces project, and he's you know knows knows the area like the back of his hand. He did look at it last year. He says, "Yeah, you're probably sitting, you know, within 10 meters." You know, that's his guess. And uh, so we've called that zone the Lost Ace because Golden Predator's got the three aces. And uh, we'll see what happens. Golden Predator right now is drilling right on our boundary, so that's going to create some excitement later in the year. And speaking of that, so you're looking at the end of the calendar year for us to get an update on the Lost Ace, is that correct? Yeah. Sounds yep. good. Mr. Pettit, before we discuss the management team and numbers, are there any reversionary interests on these projects? Uh, there are a few. Um, Chico, we're earning uh, 80% from a company called Eagle Plains, which one of our directors runs Eagle Plains, Tim Tremundi. Uh We will earn 80% by spending a couple million dollars over five years um, and issuing shares to them. And uh, it's not that onerous. It's, you know, if we find out, the, you, you structure these deals so the first year is fairly lenient 
and you can get enough information to determine whether you want to move forward. Um, the Forest Curb Project, we're earning 100% interest in all three of those projects by issuing stock to the, the underlying owners and then guaranteeing $3 million uh, worth of work across all three of them. That's easy to do up there. We'll have that completed by the end of this year. Um, and then the uh, we have 100% of the, uh, or sorry, we have 80% of the the um, Justin property up in the Yukon. Mm-hmm. It's already earned. Now, what is management's philosophy? Are you looking to build a mine or arbitrage? What we do is we, our, our intentions are always to, um, you know, you, you proceed as though you're going to build a mine. You always do that. Mm-hmm. But you always know there's going to be a buyer at some point because in the industry today, most of the, the juniors are generally used for the exploration process. And then the majors are, you know, they cut back on their exploration budgets because the juniors are doing the work for them. And then they come to the table with an offer. And that's, you know, we're, we're good at that. Um, I sold my last company, Bayfield, to New Gold. Um, you know, Tim and Ron were involved in Copper Canyon. They sold that to um, Glore Creek, or sorry, Nova Gold. Um, and then Ron, you know, we all know Ron's history is stellar in terms of M&A. So it's... Um, you know, we're we. You always listen to offers, no matter if you want to build a mine or not. Uh, personally, I don't know enough about building mines, but I do know about, you know, how to get there. Fair enough. Switching gears, I learned from Rick Rule and Doug Casey that the people running the business are equally, if not more important, than the latent material in the ground. Mr. Pettit, please introduce us to your board of directors, and what unique skill sets do they bring to the table? Well, as I just mentioned, um, our chairman, Ron Nedelitsky, is, uh, you know, one of the best explorers in the business. He rely, you know, he, he loves geochem, and that's get, that's where he gets, he starts with that and moves on, moves forward. And he is, as far as the Golden Triangle goes and as far as Saskatchewan goes, he knows more than, you know, most people. You know, there's a very few people in his, his at his level. Uh, Tim Termundi, who's a very active director, um, he started his career with Ron right out of university and has worked with him very exclusively for years, um, his whole career, and has a tremendous grounding, and he has a successful project generating company uh, called Eagle Plains. And then there's myself, who, you know, I'm on generally the corporate side. I handle all the administration. It's all out of my office, the uh, accounting, legal uh, governance, uh, everything, um, all generates from my office. And uh, then uh, uh, Cornell McDowell is running the program, and he's a, he runs as tight a ship as anybody. He's he's uh, almost a military guy in terms of his efficiency. And uh, you know he keeps our cost down, which is good. This is an expensive area we're working in, and it's easy to lose control. And last year was phenomenal. This year it looks like our drilling costs are even lower. Um, you know, our guaranteed flying time is uh, coming in under budget, so it's it's that's excellent. I met him on another project. He was overseeing the drilling and everything on 130,000 meters of drilling I did on a copper project. Um, and then we have some really good advisors. Henry Omac is like almost like Ron up in this area, in the Golden Triangle. He started up there years and years ago, and he was one of the underlying owners of uh, one of the properties that we consolidated into one package. Uh, so he's a wealth of knowledge, and uh, the other fellow, Mike Roberts, came with the Northern Project property that we we put into this uh, this land package. Uh, he came from Kiska, and he did a lot of drilling. So he's he's coming up with some really good information. So these guys are key. They are Rick and Doug are serious about what the, you know the management. You know what's their success level. Um, you know, what's their knowledge base, all that stuff. It's, it's very important. Well, you've conveyed serially successful and germane to the task at hand. It seems that the board of directors, they're the right people to have here. Tell us more about James Pettit. What makes him qualified for the task at hand? Well, you know, I got asked that once, and I started saying, well, I started and then I stopped. Because I've been um, an entrepreneur my whole life. I, I spent a short period of time 
working for a company that was expanding its restaurant chain in, in Western Canada. Probably one year. The rest of the time from high school, I was self-employed. And, and that's, you know, my background. Is, uh, you know, and I share an office with an individual that started a, an organization called Young Entrepreneurs Organization. And he, it's now a worldwide enterprise. Um, it's like Young Presidents Organization, that sort of thing. And I think they've kind of amalgamated their, their two organizations. But he started it. Um, and, you know, and we ha- we're very like-minded. This industry we're in is, uh, you know, it's perfect for somebody with an entrepreneurial mindset. What can you share with us about the technical team? The technical team is as good as it gets. Um, because of Ron's background, you know, he's done so many things and he's discovered, you know, very few people have have done what he's done. From the discovery process to the uh, completion to either a sale or into production. Um, that's key. We, we, you know, we take the information he has to offer and utilize it. He's not overly active with us, but he's there. Um, Tim is very active, um, you know, very active and has done enough of this M&A business that, that uh, you know, like myself, you know, we're there, we can do it, but then we have access to the people to move it along to whatever stage needs to be done even production. Let's discuss your share structure. Tell us about it. Well, it's a moving target right now because warrants are being exercised uh, because the stock price has moved up, obviously. Um, but right now it's uh, there's about 83 million uh, ish- shares issu- issued and outstanding and fully diluted. It's about uh, 101 million. Um, and that's changing because there's a lot that, that the fully diluted is these warrants are coming down and I, I suspect you know over the next month we'll probably have a million to a million and a half dollars just from warrant exercises which is always great to see and actually if all those warrants do get exercised I think that frees up what close to five million is that correct yeah yep it would uh, but you don't normally see warrants getting exercised until they're close to their you know expiration, expiration date, date. <laughs> um, so December, I, November, there's a, a whole series that are going to expire. So we're going to see those because your prime time, prime season for work in the Golden Triangle is, is right now mm-hmm. through to maybe October. And uh, you want to have what you're doing out there in the public domain because what will happen is, you know, then, you know, September, October, November, you start hitting tax loss selling, that sort of thing. How much cash or cash equivalents do you have? Um, we've got right now, uh, prior to the financing that we've just announced, and, and it's close, it'll close, uh, looks like today or Monday, uh, that's $4 million plus I already had two, plus the warrants, uh, another million and a half, say. So, you know, six, seven and a half million, maybe. Right, right in that range. It changes, changing daily, actually. But the financing we just closed uh, is was the lead order was with Eric Sprott, right. um, which was a good move. Eric's, you know, everybody knows Eric. He's he's uh, pretty aggressive, um, not afraid to to back good gold deals, early stage deals. Um, we also have a fund in there uh, called Palisades. Um, so it was. The allocation that came down to there was only about a half a million shares that I could allocate to to insiders and uh, you know friends and you know good shareholders. Mm-hmm. What is the uh, burn rate? Burn rate right now, if you, let's just say GNA and not not in the field, but mm-hmm. the GNA burn rate here is probably fifty thousand, uh, forty to fifty thousand a month actually, and then the burn rate in the field. I would. I gotta think it's about three to four hundred thousand. Currently, it's going to escalate shortly with this new financing. Going to be more people, probably another drill. Um, but you know, sixty percent of our budget will be drilling and helicopter costs. Okay. Which kind of leads to my next question, but if you would please expand upon it, if you can, talk to us about cash flow distribution. What is the ratio between cash spent and tangible assets on the balance sheet? 
Well, you know, these companies, what are tangible a- assets? Um, what can we sell? Um, you know, your asset base is your, you know, the value that you're given for the project. Um, as far as tangible assets go, you know, we've got a, you know, it's pretty much a paper value. Any assets that we have, uh, I own a little bit of stock. The company owns a little bit of stock in other com- companies um, because we might have sold a property. So I've got shares in other companies, and that that's maybe a half a million. But, um, you know, the money we're spending generally goes into, you know, it just gets built up over time as, as uh, losses or, um, you know, not debt as per se, but that's what you do. It's you're building up losses because these companies spend a lot of money, and if, if if they have assets to build on, great, that's excellent. Right. How much debt do you have? Um, well, there's no debt. Okay. And who are some of your institutional investors? I know you referenced uh, Mr. Sprout there, and that's a great name to have, by the way. Well, yeah, Eric is probably now the largest shareholder. Um, institutionally we we only have a few there there's a, a fund out of Europe that has a very large position but they would probably be now number three and then there's uh, a couple of individuals that this the fund side of things isn't uh, this is a big retail shareholder base that's why I trade so much like we, we're trading millions of shares a day mm-hmm. and that's good you know that's um, as far as I'm concerned, you know, I, I, when I look for a stock, I, I don't want to buy something I get stuck in. If something happens and I need to sell, I got, I want to be able to sell. Yeah, you want to get stuck, not stuck. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. But it's, but you know, we are. We we got a large retail base with a few institutions. And what is the float? The float right now would be probably forty million very tightly held uh, in terms of friends and family and I would include the institutions there because I, I tend to know what they've got. Okay. And uh, you somewhat alluded to it earlier but let's just to clear the record here are there any redundant assets such as patent mining claims? No. Okay. And what are the change of control fees? Change of control? Oh, good one. Good one. Um, right there, we keep it around three times at the most okay. like for 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 me my contract would be three times uh, my salary um, not owners I've seen I've seen them pretty extreme and by the way I don't pay myself very much none of us do and would you mind sharing that with us what that is yeah 7,000 a month all right, sir. You survived so I the keep storm. It. The reason I do oh. that is because I am a little spread out. I've got a you know a couple other companies that I'm involved in, and and you don't have to lean on one company to pay you a large amount. You know, in this business, I consider 150 a lot of money uh, a month. Yes, um, I do. And uh, but you know, I can spread that out amongst a couple other companies and I don't spend a lot of time on anything else other than this but uh, I'm there if they need help. All right, you survived the storm. Multi-layer <laughs> question here. What is the next unanswered question? When should we expect results and what will determine success? Well, I'm thinking um, probably within two weeks. Uh, I've been wrong before. The assay labs are you know they they're now in in full on backup mode. Uh, when I was just up there last week, and I took the helicopter fly around, look at uh, you know, the various like uh, the SK and KMS and Bruce Jack. I counted 20 drills turning just on the southern portion of the Golden Triangle. There's probably another 10 to 15 on the northern portion. So you know those those that core is going somewhere. And that's down probably to Terrace, where our you know we're using a lab in Terrace, and they've just moved a bunch of our our assay, our core, our pulps over to Kamloops, where they have another lab, because they're getting pretty backed up. So I'm I'm saying two weeks. So the that's two weeks is is a reference, of course, to Force Kerr, just for the record. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that's the only one that's got any work going on right now. And what will determine success once we get those results? Um, well, you know what? In in the in the heart of the summer, high grade. 
get success. Um, as you move more transition into the fall where the audience builds again and they start paying attention to what could develop into a, you know, how's this thing? It doesn't have to always be high grade because, you know, you see some of the guys that are trying to develop a resource like SNP and GT Gold. They're not getting a lot of love in the market because the market's very small right now. A lot of people are away. They're on holidays. They're not paying attention. Uh, but if you put high grade out, you do galvanize the people that are looking. So, you know, in, in my mind, you know, that that's what we're, the market we're in right now. So high grade for now. We've covered the good. What keeps you up at night that we don't know about? Not having high grade? <laughs> <laughs> uh, keep me up at night. You know what I worry about the most right now? It's not even related to what we do, but they're called events, Right worldwide events that can really shake the markets in general and because the one that gets shaken the most is usually the venture exchange um, you know because it is the riskiest the one thing that can save it is something that would be good for gold so that doesn't keep me awake at night but the other events the things that happen there's you know there's rather tumultuous out there right now and finally what did I forget to ask I think it's been pretty uh, pretty thorough, to be honest with you. I think you've been very thorough. Well, thank you, sir. James, for someone listening that wants to get more information on Avian Resources, what is the website address? The website address is Uh The symbol is TSX Venture Exchange. TSXV is ABN. The OTCQB markets in the States is ABN. AF and Frankfurt is E2L2. And for direct inquiries, please contact Don Myers at 604-639-3851. Again, that number is 604-639-3851. And last but not least, please visit our website www.provenimprobable.com where we interview the most respected names in the natural resource space. You may reach us at contact at provenimprobable.com. James Pettit of Avon Resources, thank you for joining us today on Proven and Probable. Thank you very much. And as a reminder for our listeners, Avon Resources is a sponsor of Proven and Probable. Thank you for joining us today on Proven and Probable. Remember to like and subscribe for more conversations with the most respected names in the natural resource space. Check out our website at www.provenandprobable.com. The information presented on Proven and Probable is provided for educational and informational purposes only, without any express or implied warranty of any kind, including warranties of accuracy, completeness, or fitness for any particular purpose. The information is not intended to be and does not constitute financial, investment, or trading advice, or any other advice. You should not make any financial, investment, or trading decision based on any of the information presented without first undertaking independent due diligence and consultation with a professional broker or competent financial advisor.